Hello, everyone. This is Ashin Fense, co-founder and CEO of 11 Radius. We're a circular fashion group that works with brands and great service partners to co-create the circular economy. Partners like Two Fellows Media, who are experts on storytelling and have a great story to tell us about what we should say and shouldn't say and how we say it and how that influences behavior and human behavioral change. So with that, I will turn it over to Sagi to introduce himself and his team that he's brought. Hi, I'm Sagi Shain. I'm the co-founder of Two Fellows Media. Um, and with me are uh, Danny Jarvis and Michaela Geldof, which are my storytelling experts. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Sagi. Thanks for that introduction. <laughs> Great, and let's let's kick it off. So um, I know that two fellows, your your team has some great prepared uh, instruction and videos, and then we'll uh, we'll host the conversation from there. Great stuff. Um, so hi, welcome everyone. So we're going to take you through a journey, kind of sit back, relax, and take it as a story yourself. Um, we're going to be showing a few videos, something to kind of trigger your emotions and we'll explain further why and why not. But firstly, I'd just like to introduce you to a video that sparked interest with amongst our whole company and something that is stuck and just stuck with storytelling and something that we use as a pivotal moment and factor to kind of integrate everything that we've learned and to kind of also showcase what we can do for you. And that's an awkward sound, so. <laughs> and here In we go. 2009, a man, a journalist, by the name Rob Walker, wanted to find out is, is storytelling really the most powerful tool of all? And in order to do this, he went on his computer and he bought 200 objects from eBay. And the average price of the objects were about $1. He then called 200 authors and he asked them, hey, would you like to be part of the significant object study? Which means that I would like to write a story to one of the objects. And 200 authors said yes. So there he had 200 objects, he had 200 stories. And I assume that it was with nail-biting anticipation that he went on eBay again with all the 200 objects. Would there be a difference? Would there be a change? Do you think there was a change? One of the objects was this, this beautiful horse's head. There we go. The beautiful horse's head. Now this beautiful horse's head was bought for 99 cents and was sold when the story was added for $62.95. That is a slight increase of 6,395%. So was this a one-off situation? Not really, because he bought the 200 objects for a total of $129, selling them for $8,000. Now that's insane. So if we were to leave you on this note, it kind of gives a sleazy feel that we perhaps just want to take your money and perhaps give you a kind of business where we can say, yes, we'll push your sales but not really care much for your brand would you actually work for us or would we work for you but if we were to show you the end of the video but you know what's even more intellectually challenging to understand is how can you and i go to the movies and pay good money to watch movies like james bond who are absolutely unrealistic and we sit there we enjoy the movie and some of us we really enjoy the movie and we leave the theater going like God, what a man. <laughs> I would like to be more like him. I'd like to walk like him. I'd like to talk like him. I like Bond. Wonder how I could be more like Bond. And then this weird revelation hits you like from nowhere. You come up with the brilliant idea to walk to a watchmaker shop. And wow, it just happens to be an Omega watch in that shop that resembles the one that Bond was wearing in the movie. And you pay $10,000 to put that watch on your wrist and you leave that store feeling more like Bond. How is that possible? PQ Media tells us 
that $10.5 billion is turned over in product placement revenue every single year. How is it possible for you to be so easily tricked by something so simple as a story? Because you are tricked. Well, it all comes down to one core thing, and that is emotional investment. The more emotionally invested you are in anything in your life, the less critical and the less objectively observant you become. I'm going to hand it over to Danny so she can dig into the impacts of this video. So essentially what happens is with stories and with storytelling, they are inherently emotional. Yeah. You would have had an emotional reaction, something that would have gone on in your body to feel a certain way by watching each one of those clips. And when we start to observe that, that's where it becomes more powerful in terms of being able to tell your story in a way that will elicit a certain emotional response. Because as David Phillips mentioned in his TED talk that we've just seen now, the emotional response that is elicited within a story dictates how powerful it can be. Yeah, I'm just gonna go across. So essentially all storytelling is hormone creating because we kind of understand, okay, stories give us an emotional response. You all know how your favorite storybook from childhood would make you feel if you came across it today, yeah? But within that, how? You know, there's a question mark of how do we go from the story into the emotion which then dictates the action? And that is the basis of emotional storytelling. And so this is just a slide that we've put together which you're welcome to take a screenshot of to use for your reference later on, which shows us some of the stressful, the stressful hormones that can be listed in our body as an emotional response or some of the happier hormones that can be listed in our body as an emotional response. So, and just to touch on things quickly, dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins, those are all those things that will leave you with a warm fuzzier feeling on the inside. So dopamine is essentially pleasure inducing. And what that does is when we are in a situation where we have a stimulus that is evoking dopamine within our system, as soon as dopamine starts firing, we begin to have those high levels of focus, motivation, feeling creative and triggering something from our memory where we're wanting to bring it in. And that is induced by leaving your audience at a cliffhanger, yeah? I mean, it's so ingrained within Netflix videos. You can see it on a day-to-day -day basis where you get to the end of an episode and you just have to go into the next one, yeah? Then we've got oxytocin. So oxytocin is very much that feeling of being in love. And if you know or you've experienced being in love yourself, it is quite a roller coaster of emotions and hormones that go on in your body. Within that, oxytocin is a major component because within oxytocin, as soon as that starts to be released in your system, you're far more trusting, far more open, far more generous. You want to share so much more. Yeah, It's that hormone that helps us to bond with one another. And within that, we can induce it within a story by showing some empathy for the character. Yeah, So if you look at a lot of the humanitarian campaigns within storytelling, the most effective ones hone in on one person, one person who becomes a person in your eyes within a very short space of time. They go to school, they experience similar things to you, but possibly in a very different way to how you would have experienced them. And within that, you're empathizing with the person, you're mirroring them, you're seeing them, you've got your similarities, but there's such a big difference maybe in terms of income or social status or poverty line that you want to fill that gap because there's such a feeling within you. You see yourself as that person, you've had similar experiences and you wanna help them. That's where the oxytocin comes into it. Then we've got those endorphins, yeah? So endorphins, a lot of the time will come off of an endorphin high when you're at the gym once you finished a good session of sweating yeah so within those 
the triggers that happen in our body gives us a feeling of pleasure, well-being, and sometimes pain relief as well from a hormonal perspective. So you don't quite remember how sore your muscles feel at that point in time, but you still want to go back because it's happy hormones, essentially, you know, you're on that high. And within that, you become more relaxed, you become more focused, you become more creative, you know, and the most easy way to trigger endorphins is simply by laughter. Yeah. And what's an amazing thing is we also have these neurons within our brain called mirror neurons. So naturally, as soon as you are in an interaction with somebody, you will start mirroring them and they will start mirroring you. So choosing what kind of characters and the emotional response that they're going to bring onto your screen or into your story immediately starts to trigger those within the person who's watching its brain. Yeah, that's pretty much just a basic human one-on-one -on -one bonding system. And then the stressor hormones. Yeah, so we've all heard of cortisol. We've all heard of adrenaline. Cortisol is essentially our body's main stress response hormone. And it's induced by an, intensi an intensity and longevity of a specific stressor. Now, remember, back in the day, stressors used to be the lion coming to eat us. And we have to run away when we're on the hunt, talking about ancient humans, right? Now, we might not face lions on a day-to-day -day basis, but what we do face is our boss being intense or having a deadline or some traffic or maybe not so much in situations where we're in lockdown, but there's that stress of what's going to come next. How am I going to respond? And in those moments when we have big stress responses, this is where adrenaline is triggered. Yeah. And essentially the research shows that we have a fight, a flight, and also a freeze response. Like you remember those situations when you were at maybe at school and you had a test and you've done all the studying, and you got there and you had all this information, but you just went blank. That's that freeze response, which the research is now starting to understand also comes from adrenaline. And adrenaline is essentially induced by fear, excitement, danger, threats, and they can be internal or external stresses. But what's very important to notice is that they can be perceived threats or they can be real threats. Yeah. So it might not necessarily be the lion coming along, it could be somebody takes out a gun in the Netflix series. Yeah, immediate let go of adrenaline rushing through our system. So within that, we have two forms of communication that come out of it. We've got positive action communication in terms of our happy hormones, just to put it that way simply, and our negative action communication, which comes out of our stresses. And so Guy is going to be touching a bit more on examples of those. So as we go into a couple of examples, just notice how you feel when you're watching this. Notice what's going on in your body, what's going on in your system as you're observing this stimulus, essentially. Welcome to Casa de Carne. We take the dining experience full circle. We'd like to start. I'll have the baby back ribs, please. Oh, the ribs. Amazing. First time? Yes. Excellent choice. Follow me. Good luck. We'll be after.
gonna do it. That was awesome. I've never done a cow before. It just tastes so much fresher. I know, I feel like a caveman. So, Eric, what'd you think? Okay, set the side that I think it's a brilliant ad, um, but I want to talk about how the, actual, the type of communication they basically used, okay? So in simple psychology, we basically have the drama triangle, which is quite known, and then we have the winning triangle, which is uh, compared to or what you can do in, instead. Now, regardless, or so put aside, uh, criticize a, a you know, criticism about the vegan um, way of communicating. Most of them, they're basically using fear or shock uh, tactics, which is basically the triangle of prosecutor, victim, and rescue. This is basically a situation where it's basically a cycle that we go through. They basically want to, they want to blame us of, of uh, trying not to, uh, to know the full circle of what we're eating, right? Now, I want to show you, which is, it's not in the same category, but I want to show you, um, compare to this ad, another ad, and just try to observe of how you feel during this ad.
Okay. So basically we can see the massive difference that, or at least I hope so, the, between the different, the feelings that we have between the first and the second ad. Now, regarding what I said before, um, in the first ad, you basically felt the adrenaline, you felt nervous, you felt, um, you can also, I mean, they did it quite smart with the music. They tried to freak you out. They tried to shock you, right? They tried to kind of put the truth into your face. Um, now, I want to talk about the benefits of having something as a negative or uh, aiming for cortisol uh, uh, or adrenaline type of storytelling compared to a endorphins uh, um, type. So the massive difference is that you gain amid or you gain big supporters when you have, uh, when you, when you uh, target ads or, or storytelling based on adrenaline and, and cortisol. What happened is basically that uh, 10, 20, 30% of people that watch this and convert into, the, into your cause or into what you're trying to sell, let's say, um, they will become really big fans. But the 70% or the 80% that watch it and are horrified and have that, uh, and have that memory, they basically start, because of, the, of these type of tactics, they basically start to hate you. And that's basically something that we can see that is happening with the uh, veganism movement. Their cause is just, yes, we want to kill less animals, want to protect the environment and, and etc. But the way they do it, veganism as a movement already has their own memes of how much they've been hated. So, and the interesting fact is that even though that when you do, when you design an ad or story, uh, storytelling based on endorphins, the memory uh, of receiving it or, me or memory of the ads are usually shorter. And that's already been also biologically proven because cortisol stays in your body uh, um, for a longer period of time than endorphin. But the big picture or what you're trying to achieve on the longer term will be a bigger conversion longer term. And that's the massive difference between doing using shock therapy or using uh, fear tactics um, versus using, let's say, a proactive way of uh, um, storytelling. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that even though that you can scare people into getting into your cause, it would be easier if you're going to proactively, you're going to try to push them or convince them to join you. So instead of shaming people, oh, why didn't you eat me today? Encourage them of well done, you didn't eat me today. So that's the massive difference that uh, I want to kind of discuss and, and, and cover between the true drama triangle to winning triangle um, storytelling tactics. And then um, also Michaela is gonna tell you a little bit more of how um, you can actually do it when it comes to marketing tactics as well. I'm gonna dive in. I'm literally full of emotion. It's like a roller coaster. I don't. I can watch those ads millions of times over. I know what's gonna happen, but it's still so. They've done it so well. They tap onto everything because they also know their audience, and that is one of the biggest things that you need to start with. Yes, you can have a brilliant, brilliant idea. You can think of the best invention, but if you don't tie a story to that, if you don't tie an identity to who you are, how you're meant to relate to who you want to attract and who you want to buy, who wants you to buy your products, it's a matter of just knowing the ins and outs, no matter how long it takes, once that foundation is set, you're good to go. So what we like to do is obviously start um, millions of questions can seem a bit overwhelming and tedious and a bit redundant but every single question counts because ideally you want to communicate on an authentic level because that relates the most so essentially it would be a matter of knowing what your brand is and what you stand for your values now this can be anything this can be truly maybe a value that you as a brand owner, you feel that honesty or transparency or 
perhaps community is a strong value within you and then you want to translate that through your brand. But in order to kind of relate your brand to your audience is a matter, like I said, of knowing who you're talking to and who you're talking to. There's too many people in the world you need to be really specific in the sense that Siri can't actually pick me up because I think you can see green. So um, just tapping onto this, let me first give you an example. So this is a, obviously we might know all known Nando's. Um, and in South Africa, Nando's is the pivotal advertising. I mean, they just gems and everything they do, they just know their audience, they just relate, they bring in factors of humor, they bring in um, scare tactics, or they even just bring in political issues that kind of just bring a play on things. So you kind of remember it a bit more. So they know their audience. So when it comes to knowing your audience, essentially we like to have an uh, avatar, what we call it, um, or you can call it a persona, and it's essentially one person that you're thinking of, let's go with Tom. Tom has brown hair, blue eyes. He wakes up at seven o'clock in the morning. He, the first thing he does is turn over and go on Instagram. Then you go on further, then Tom wakes up, he showers while he's um, getting ready for work. Maybe he's driving onto his commute, he listens to a podcast. Perhaps un, uh, once he arrives at work, he then goes through emails, he subscribes to certain things, so he's getting emails in different ways. This is called a dialo, a day in the life of. So this is a day in the life of Tom. This is kind of how you try and find the ins and outs of who Tom is. Um, where he, where you'll be best to find targeting him, where it would be, be, be best to talking to him. You're not necessarily, Tom's 25 years old, you're not necessarily going to send Facebook ads to him because Tom uses Facebook for birthdays. When, in fact, Instagram is the first thing he looks at. You know Tom's going to be online most likely about 9 o'clock. Lucky Tom, he starts work only at 11. So the more and more you know, it becomes fun. It becomes really more human you actually know your audience as a human as a person and this just strengthens everything you do because then you'll start to realize how your values can align with tom how your how your brand values then speak through your values then speak to your goals what are your goals are you wanting to go actually for sales are you wanting to build a community for example big brands like nike adidas they yes they are like multi-millionaires but in the sense, they're also building a community. They know they're clever. They know that people want to relate. People want to feel human and part of something. It's just inherited with us. It started from the campfires that we sat around with our ancestors. You want to feel part of the community. And that all adds and adds and adds and builds on. So essentially from your goals, when you figure out what Tom does every day, um, what he looks like, what his hair color is like, what he wears, especially if it's for um, a fashion brand. You need to know what he wears, what he might be inclined to. Is he going to jump on the crop trend? Hopefully not. But I mean, <laughs> it's all just a matter of just knowing this person. And it could be, it is obviously going to be as imaginative as possible. But the more you think about it, the more tedious the questions come, he becomes real. Even print a picture of Tom, find Tom on the internet and print a picture, put him in your office and know this is who we're targeting for our brand, the guest list, we're targeting Tom. So it then goes in further because once you then know all of this information about who you're talking to, you know how to tap onto the emotions. You know how many seconds his attention span is. You know what, he, what platforms he's gonna use, like I just explained the whole Instagram and Facebook situation. But then maybe one day we bring up a product that's something more Tom's mom's liking, but we don't know anything about Tom's mom's liking, but we want to start a collection that's more directed to an older woman generation. So then we start again at the drawboard. We then make up Mary and Mary, we know everything about Mary. Mary loves to garden. So maybe this garment will be more practical for her and so on and so forth. But we're not going to target her on Instagram because she, she just thinks it's a frivolous platform and everyone just judges everyone and she doesn't understand the mo moment of tap tap. So Facebook is so much better because she can have quizzes all day long and she can jump on it after gardening. So you see what I'm doing here. I'm building a person and becoming more relatable and it becomes stronger. And then this is how you can really tap into people's emotions. 
Like for example, I'm, I mean, if you had seen me in the watching the second video, I'm like welling up because I'm just a very emotional person. And my mom has taught me that just take things in a matter of kindness and do kindness every day and it will build up and come back. So then you also know someone's values, you know how you're going to relate to them. And especially when it's a sustainable, even better, a circular brand, you know that these people are in tune with nature. They're in tune with wanting to change and bring proactive change. So target those people authentically and be as authentic and transparent within yourself because then you'll be able to smack bang, relate to them and not in a sleazy way at all, in a more welcoming and listen we see you we know what the problem is even admit maybe you don't know everything be as humble as possible because would you really when choosing a friend would you choose the person that is more humble or the person that's boastful think of your audience as your friends literally as your friends and you'll be able to relate to them on a storytelling on another level yeah and i think also just to tap into that um you know, storytelling definitely becomes that toolkit, that piece within our toolkit, excuse me, of something that we can use on a day to day basis, whether it is through writing a little caption that would appear on a label or a poster, or taking a still photograph, or putting together a whole video production. Yeah, we just need to be mindful that storytelling actually provokes change within us. You know, as much as you feel, as much as you emote, is how much action can be generated through a story, yeah? And, and just some quotes by Mark Manson, you know, they tap into pretty much the essence of storytelling in that we don't always control what happens to us, but we can always control how we interpret what happens to us, as well as how we respond. So yes, there can be something that happened, a fact, but whether you're gonna look at that fact from one perspective or another perspective, or you're gonna bring in both of those and then make a difference or an inference is where the power of storytelling lies. And so within that, stories, telling them effectively and telling them from certain perspectives shifts that power dynamic. So really just, you know, taking that as a, almost a summary of what we've presented here is that just know that the way that you tell your story is your power. You know, it is your truth and it is something that is of value. That's not a cliffhanger or anything. <laughs> Make it into one. What's next? <laughs> Drop mic. That was, that was we need to go into song. You could, if you want to, you could, you could simulate some some nice endorphins and um, happy emotions in all of us. Um, that was really great. I love how you bring it all together. And for me, at least, many things that I've kind of learned started to click together when you when you discuss especially the difference um, in, in hormonal chemistry between those happy emotions as you describe and the ones that induce stress. Um, you know, a little a little factoid that I learned recently that that really this illuminates um, in a in a different domain from business in the in the political arena, uh, I learned that when a candidate is ahead in the polls coming up to election day, many times their campaign managers will suggest that they um, run negative advertising against their opponent, because what that does is it induces that freeze response, that stress response, and people then get locked into, you know, just like Siggy, you're describing with the, the really militant vegans, they get locked into um, their existing stances. And so of course, if the candidate is ahead, you don't want anyone to change their minds. Like, hey, everyone just freeze right where you are and we'll take this this um, set of statistics to the election day, right? Whereas when a candidate is behind, the Nothing candidate the says, start to run positive ads because you want, as you said, Tsugi and, and, and Danny, you want them to start changing their minds and, and, and going to a different place. You know, what's uh, very interesting about storytelling is that people don't realize, but a memory is, is basically an experience plus a feeling. So, 
And I think this is also where a lot of sustainable companies or just just companies in general, where they kind of lose the point is that you, if you, first of all, you need to create or you need to trigger a feeling. And this is where already a lot of companies kind of miss the point, especially sustainable companies. This is how I feel at least. Because they want to talk about the technicality of stuff or they want to talk about, but it doesn't eventually you need to think, will my audience remember this ad or not? Or am I just glorifying myself because I'm cool or because I think I changed the world? But eventually what you need to do is you need to create a real engagement with your, with, with your audience. You need to know your audience. You need to know what triggers them. If you don't know what the triggers them, how would, why do you think they're just going to like what you have just because you posted it or because you put it on Google ads or, or Facebook ads or whatever? So the idea is, like Michaela said, to do a real research about who your audience is. And, you know, in, in, the, in our office, we say, okay, will Tom like this or not? Will he wear this or not? Will he watch this or not? This is the massive difference between, you know, regular ads where people just skip and something that, oh, okay, it made me stop. It made me think, how do I feel about it? Now, there's no right or wrong about what indoor, uh, what uh, chemicals you want to produce because you can, if, if you're a really good marketer, like these com political campaigners are, they know when to use which chemical in your brain. Problem is that sustainable companies or let's say if, if we're on topic of veganism, they use only one tactic mostly. And this is how they are doing misjustice to the general cause or to, to the bigger picture. So once companies will realize, okay, how can I make it cool? How do I make it rememberable? And when we understand it, we, we remember something because we had a good experience and we had an, a feeling attached to it. I think it, it's easier to make campaigns and getting your goals and achieving your goals once you have that in mind. And this is where I feel a lot of companies and a lot of brands are missing the point. Absolutely. And I, I love... Michaela. Sorry for the rant. Just, uh, I used to do it. No, that's fine. And I, I love the the dilo, the, the day in the life of. That's that's something I, I've taken straight from your... Um, I learned from, from the piece that you wove in. Um, so how do you think about... You know, first, a, a couple of questions. How do you create that day in the life of? Uh, as you think through what your um, what your customers customers are thinking about when you work with brands, especially brands that really emphasize sustainability and circularity, um, how do you build that day in the life of for what their customers are thinking and experiencing and consuming? So I think, um, I'm Michael, I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you. <laughs> it's gonna be a challenge, fun, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> feel free to jump in though saggy because i'm just also attaching on to what saggy just mentioned how he's like something needs to be cool and when knowing your brand and knowing your audience i mean everyone wants to be cool even if it's not the sleek shades and the leather jackets and the, like if everyone turns and stops and says everyone coolness is fitting in or standing out and being admired so with the dialogue coming into place, you can also be clever because this is touching your brand identity, own, own who you are and say, we're cool, we're making sustainability cool. And sustainability means, for example, H&M is brought, well, brought out like a few years ago an ad where it's like, wear, wear this, wear pink and red together. Like honestly, they kind of emphasizing just truly be authentically yourself and bring in campaigns and stuff in that brings that whole storyline into place and kind of solidifies your values. But then to bring it into the dialogue, so essentially, you know everything about Tom. Then you know Tom's fears, his dreams, his wants, his what his career is that he's maybe not happy and maybe he wants to become a politician, but he wants to advocate for sustainability because he feels no one is there. So again, it's all up to the imagination, but there are people like that and people relate to that because it's just 
the world is so vast and people are going through the same things, experiencing the same um, situations when it comes to political agendas. Yes, you may, may be tracked in an algorithm hole, but essentially maybe one day you see a different ad and that stops you and you change everything that you ever believed because their the impact and emotion was so strong. So it's a matter of a day in the life of Tom he, you know his dreams, you know his hopes, you know that he doesn't like his job. So maybe one day you make a video that's it's a campaign that's more like we want to actually advocate that every t-shirt we sell, we plant a tree. And he kind of incentivizes with that. He attaches emotion to that because, he, oh, that's really, really cool. Like, I love trees. I love plants. My mom's a gardener. This makes so much sense to me. It all starts clicking in. Mm -hmm. So then essentially, then you will obviously start to gauge on your traction. And don't think that your day in the life of or Tom is a stagnant. He changes like we all do, like we grow, we change our dreams, we change our hopes, we change who we love. We one day, maybe we like Katy, Katy Perry, one day we're a bit over her. People are just, you know what I mean? They just kind of swap and change. So don't be stagnant in who your audience is. Constantly do the research, constantly track what the um, insights are saying on Instagram, Facebook, whatever platform you are, because they're not lying to you those figures are real and they're there to help you so use that utilize it and then your day in the life might change as tom grows and so you're what yeah. you're saying is you're, you're putting things out you're testing them and you're seeing kind of maybe you put out three different versions that you think tom might like and you see what gets the most engagement like, and you're, you're then sort of coming back and saying what have we learned about tom today and how do we modify that that image of yeah. and that that avatar of, of what um, our, our target customer looks like and, and experiences. You know, it's in today's world, I think uh, if we look at advertising 50, 60 years ago, it was so difficult because they basically created uh, an avatar or a Tom and then just people believed, okay, this is how I'm supposed to be. But today with social media and with online marketing, people have more exposure to different type of cultures, personalities, and they're also more aware that they can ask themselves more questions or they can doubt what they've believed so far. People are more open to conspiracies today and they're more open to new information that they're able to doubt themselves, they're able to develop. You know, if you look at literature, uh, 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 literature uh, uh, a few years ago, you would see that, you know, a clown would have only one type of personality but, you know, with time, people understand that um, characters have, you know, you have a deep character, which has more than a clown could be happy, could be sad, it could be crazy, it could be, you know, it could be different types of the same character. So today it's so easy because you have social media and if you want to put something into a test, it's so simple just to see reactions. I mean, this is, you know, you, again, you mentioned political campaigners, this is what they do. You know, they create fires and want to see how does it uh, affect um, public opinion and then they can base a decision on that. Now, now that I think it's healthy, it is a tactic because it's so easy to do. You don't need to fabricate anything. That's what's interesting in today's ability with especially social media. You know, I, I think the image of marketers as multifaceted clowns is quite fitting uh, for those of us who are, are telling stories. I have a, a final question for you. So uh, for the, the, the brands that are fashion brands in, you know, in apparel and in, in footwear and, and accessories that might be watching and saying, all right, I understand kind of what not to do. I understand how not to play on fear and stress emotions and how to play on some of the emotions that will stimulate dopamine and um, oxytocin and, and endorphins. What Can you translate that for, for us to what might that look like in what they put on their webpage, what they put on their packaging, what they put on their hang tags, how they, you know, what kind of Instagram stories they share. You know, give us a couple of examples of how you can play on those happy emotions and avoid those, those stressor, stressor emotions. I feel like you want to say something. <laughs> yeah, so... Just in terms of that, you know, we've done a bit of research at the moment for a couple of clients of ours where we're looking into that factor of waste within the textile industry, mm. right? 
And in terms of that, being able to start, tell a story about what does waste mean? When I say waste, immediately the brain triggers, Ew, you know, right. <laughs> quite literally to give it an expression. But within the textile industry, waste doesn't have to be icky. It can actually be useful and translated into a treasure, right? And so being able to mold that into your brand's story, you know, building on whatever your values are, whether you value trust, whether you value honesty, whether you value being bold and artistic, doesn't matter. But the way how you tell your story about what waste, as an example, is, can translate through that. So being able to make up a positive Instagram post that says, you know what, today we saved 250 grams of waste fabric. This is how we're using it. Mm -hmm. And from there, it's a positive impact. And then you can also tie it in and bring in the fact that maybe this might not seem like a big amount to you, but actually that is 250 grams less than the X amount of tons that are going into landfills every day. This is how we take small steps, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you're aligning your brand values, you're telling a positive story about what is going on, and you're able to reframe and tell the story in a different way. Because let's say that you have a consumer who's reading this, or who comes across it on Instagram, and they say, you know, they could get interested in it because it's such a small amount, but then they could also get interested in it because there is a tangible difference being made. Mm -hmm. And from that aspect of things, as somebody who's consciously doing my best to consume in a better way, to make a better impact from that perspective, because that's where I fit into the wheel of things, right. I'm far more likely to come back to that brand because I can see the difference they are making. And I want to buy into that and I want to support that because that's honest, you know, that's upfront, that's transparent. It's saying we're not here we're getting there these are our little steps join us along the way let's make a difference together yeah i don't know if you want to add to mm. anything of that um just like as a short recap because going back to owning yourself and owning your brand and owning kind of your audience and knowing who they are i mean Rob Nixon, he wrote his paper called Slow Violence and Environmentalism of the Poor. And he says that we need to perhaps change our understanding of violence because we all know violence as fast, impactful, blood, gore. So you are more than, more than likely to have all those negative emotions when you see those things. But instead, waste can see and seen as a good or a bad thing, but it's seen as a bad thing because it's been not being used. Um, I mean, from our perspective, we see it as goods, literally resources that are just being thrown out the window when in fact they could be used. So change the definition, change what the meaning of violence means. Me violence is slow, it's impactful, it's gradual, because at the end of the day, we're going to come up with the consequences so later, and then that's going to be impactful, blood, gore, poverty, famine, diseases, everything and so on, and then we have, we're way too late to kind of react. So also tap onto those emotions, be like, yes, it's not happening now, but we need to change the way we're thinking because the world is developing so quickly, but we're not really, and brands are not really. And speaking to um, like guests for, at Guess for Change, it, there's a common theme where it's just like, people are not understanding the impacts. And if they are, they feel that they're not making a difference. So like Danny explained, show your audience, like even show your factories, like show little aspects that just become a bit more human because it adds to the story. It brings in the emotion. You're like, yes, I bought this t-shirt and you show everyone. You're like, I've had planted five trees today. You know what I mean? Like it just goes a bit further and just change definitions. Also, for example, the notion of wild, like you seen as out of control, chaos and everything. We're naturally wild, wild nature, like it's beautiful. It's something that's very actually inherent in all of us. So why are we seeing it as such a negative thing? Like Annabelle Hooter, she says um, waste is a colonial construct because we're seeing it as all this negativity and the way of colonialism, it's just always seen as a bad negative thing. When actually we need to just 
flip it back and then start telling stories differently because it will go further because we're actually tapping onto your good emotions now. So people need to start thinking more in a community way, thinking in a long-term way and do that with your brands. And honestly, if more and more brands start to do it, it's more than likely like groups, communities, populations, it's just going to ripple through. So it all starts with brands. Unfortunately, we maybe can't control governments the way we want to. So why not do it with your brand? Start with a story. I love that. I mean, Danny's talking about repurposing the idea of waste to something more positive. Don't focus on, as we've seen so many sort of the fashion equivalent of your vegan ads, Sagi, where we focus on the heaps and heaps of landfills and all of the, the textiles that are ending up in them. Instead, focus on we diverted some waste and we changed it by doing this with it, this really positive thing. We created something beautiful. And Michaela, what you're talking about is if we all do this as brands, we can start to move societal impulses and societal perspectives on this whole sustainable fashion and circular economy and circular fashion movement and looking at how do we make that a positive movement and not one that is focused on shaming individuals who aren't involved in it. I think I also, it's great. I think also, also what's quite important is that you also need to be, I think we kind of missed also a bit of a point there, but we need to be original. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of, you know, if you have a specific industry, they're using the same definitions, the same tactics. You know, I just, you know, remembered now that uh, I'm, I'm, we're part of a crowdfunding campaign and the, I have an experience of a person that he uh, saw a sad video about an old lady who doesn't have money to eat, so he donated. Now he's been targeted with all these sad videos of all these you know, people that are having a hard time in life. And he said, I don't want to do anything anymore because all, all, all I see is all these sad videos. So the problem is that same industries use the same tactics and it's multiplied. So to be original, it's also very important um, to think outside of the box and, you know, redefine definitions that are maybe for a very long time in the industry, because who said this is the only way to go? You can be original, you can think outside of the box, you can try, and you can also, you know, do a mistake, which is also fine. Um, calculated mistakes are quite important and uh, all risks in, in, in any industry. I love it. So be creative, be unique, be positive and focus on positive emotions and avoid triggering stressor emotions and, and negativity. And we can encourage us all to move forward. That's, uh, that's brilliant. I love it. And I'm glad that you guys are helping us co-create this, this circular economy and, and spreading good stories around. Thank you all for your, um, you're just great stories that you told us and the emotions that you instilled in us and incited and uh, and described what we were experiencing. This is great. And uh, I can tell that um, um, brands love working with you in, in creating their own brands and stories. So thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for so giving us this platform to share mm -hmm. because honestly, when we go back to it, storytelling is just about sharing. You know, Literally. <laughs> it's about sharing at the core. So thank you very much for it. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thanks everyone.